Hi there. Today I'd like to talk to you about electrical work and potential energy. So first of all, let's jump right in and review the concept of work. Work is energy transferred to or from an object by the application of a force. Mathematically, this is expressed as the work is equal to the integral of the force dotted with the displacement over the entire displacement. Make sure to measure the displacement from the point of the application of the force. Remember that the force does no work on the object if the force doesn't move through a displacement. So you can push on a wall all day long, but if the wall doesn't move, maybe you've exercised your muscles, but you've done no work. Next, because of the dot product application, or the dot product um, part of the equation, the work done on the force of a moving object is zero if the force applied is perpendicular to the displacement at the point of the application. Okay, and this is because it's a vector dot product. And so in the sketch up here, it shows the force dotted with the displacement. The force is in an angle to the displacement. Maybe you've got a rope tied to a block and you're pulling it along, but the block stays on the floor and so the, there's an angle theta in between those two. So we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but just remember that it's only the part of the force that's parallel to the displacement that contributes to the work because of that vector dot, dot product. It also means that for motion that's in a circle, for example, there's not gonna be any work done, okay? So tangential forces are, are the ones that do the work, but radial forces that point in, they don't do any work if the force is um, if the object's moving in a circle. All right, now when work is done, energy is transferred. That comes from the equation. One example of that would be the transfer um, from kinetic energy to potential energy, or vice versa, from potential to kinetic. So work and potential energy are therefore related by a minus sign. If work's done, then that's equal to the negative of the change in the potential energy. So that means that we can write the equation for the potential energy um, as well. That would be the change in the potential energy delta U is equal to the negative integral of F dot ds. So the sign of the work can be a little confusing. Sometimes in different physics texts they talk about the work done on the system versus the work done by the system. Okay? So it's important to remember that in the equation for work that I showed you on the previous slide that that is going to be the work done by the force that's in that equation. Okay? So for example, if you had two positive charges, we know that like charges repel one another. If you had two positive charges um, and you let go, the, force, the charges would fly apart. Okay? They would be repelled from one another. So if you want to move those charges closer together, okay, that's opposite the way that um, they would want to go. And so you would have to push them in. An outside agent, you for example, would have to move those charges closer together. So that would be work done on the system. Whereas if you had the two charges and you let them go and you let them fly apart, well that work would be done by the force um, of Coulomb's law repulsion, okay? All right, now generally in an introductory level class, we're talking about the electric potential energy between two charges, call them charge one and charge two, Q1 and Q2. Then we use the following equation. U is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R12. Now here, let me define what my variables are. K is the Coulomb constant. That's 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. This constant can also be written as one over four pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. So you might see that in some other textbooks or in some other lectures, but K and one over four pi epsilon naught are equivalent numerically. So that's K. The Q1 and the Q2 is the product of the two charges. So for example, if you had a five microcoulomb charge and a two nanocoulomb charge, then you would multiply those two magnitudes together to get the um, top part of that, uh, the, the top part of that equation. Now R12 is the center to center distance between your two charges. So it's the center to center distance between charge one and charge two. Now, the equation here, this potential energy, is the amount of energy that it would require to bring the two charges together if they started off infinitely far apart. Usually the way people speak about this is they take one of the charges and consider it fixed, and then take the other charge and take it from infinity and put it at its position as you, as you move it in, okay? So let me demonstrate that 
and derive this equation for you. Okay, so if you start from the equation that relates the force to the potential energy, which we showed on a previous slide, that's that the change in the potential energy is equal to the negative dot product of the integral of f dot ds. Okay, so negative integral of f dot ds. Now, let's plug in the Coulomb's law force, which we covered in a previous lecture. So the Coulomb's law force is k q1 q2 over r squared, and that's along the r hat direction, which is, of course, the direction that um, you draw a dotted line connecting the two charges center to center, and the force will be parallel to that line. So that's what the r hat or the radial vector there is for. Okay, so that's your Coulomb's law force. We're plugging that in for our force in the negative integral of f dot ds, and we're doing an integral. Now, it's important to realize that your displacement ds doesn't have to be in the radial direction. It doesn't have to be along, in other words, that center to center line connecting those two charges. If I have a fixed charge that's here, and then the final position of this charge would say be right here, I could take it in at some weird angle and bring it in from infinity that way and that would be perfectly valid. But remember that this is a vector dot product, okay? A vector dot product. Remember that the definition of a dot product is, let's say that you're taking the dot product of two vectors, A and B, generic vectors. A dot B is AB cosine of theta. That would be the magnitude given for your dot product. Now, the cosine theta component means that any component of the displacement vector that's not along that radial line that connects the two charges doesn't contribute, okay? And another way of putting it is that the Coulomb's law force is a conservative force, and that means it's path independent. So let's say that you have, like in your drawing here, a charge that's indicated in blue that's moving towards the fixed charge that's indicated in black, okay? If you start at some path over here and you want to move it into its final position, you could take any one of the three paths shown, okay? But regardless of which one of those paths you take, you're going to end up with the same potential energy for the configuration. Let's say that you take some funny curvy path right here, and let's look at ds, the little differential path um, at some point shown here in red. If you break that into its vector components, it's got the radial component that points along parallel to that line connecting the initial and final position of the charges. It's got that component, but it also has a component that's perpendicular to that. But remember that the perpendicular component will not be um, a part, will not be included. It'll go to zero when you take that vector dot product. So that's why the crazy path doesn't really matter too much, okay? So we're left then with this equation. The change in the potential energy is equal to the negative integral from infinity to r of k q1 q2 over r squared dr. We're left with just the radial component, in other words, okay? So now, this is an integral with respect to the position r. So we're going to perform that integral. Now when we do that, we end up with k q1 q2 over r. And then we have to evaluate that integral from infinity to r. Now when you subtract those things, you end up with k q1 q2 over r12, where r12 is the distance the, at the final position between charge 1 and charge 2, minus k q1 q2 over infinity. Well, 1 over infinity goes to 0, and so that second term goes away, and we're just left with the expression that we wanted to derive, k q1 q2 over r12. And that gives us the potential energy in between the two point charges, the equation that we um, said we would derive earlier. Let me do an example of a potential energy problem. It's a simple example, but it's kind of fun. Let's consider the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom in its ground state. So in this, the electron has a circular orbit about the proton at a distance of the Bohr radius. The Bohr radius is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. If you go through modern physics, you know and you learn that the speed of the electron as it travels in its circular orbit around this nu nucleus is about 2.2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So this is fast, but it's not fast enough that you have to consider relativistic speeds. That was something that Schrodinger con, um, considered when he originally published his equation. So what's the potential energy in between the electron and the proton, the Coulomb potential energy? And what's the total mechanical energy? Mechanical energy, remember, is the sum of the kinetic plus the potential. 
So let's calculate using this equation, u is equal to k q1 q2 over r12. Let's go ahead and calculate what that potential energy is. Plugging in for the Coulomb constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th newton meters squared per Coulomb squared, and then multiplying times the two charges, Q1, which is the proton, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and then times the charge of an electron, minus 1.2, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and then divided by the distance in between the proton and the electron in its ground state um, Bohr radius. So that's 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. If you do this, then you end up with a potential energy of negative 4.35 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. If you want to convert this into electron volts, which is a handier unit for the energy of an electron and a hydrogen atom anyway, all you'd have to do is divide by the conversion constant between joules and electron volts. The conversion constant is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per electron volt. If you divide by that, then you end up with an energy, potential energy, of minus 27.2 electron volts. Now, the kinetic energy of that electron would be given by 1 half mv squared. Like I said, we don't have to use the relativistic expression for kinetic energy because it's not going fast enough, less than 1% the speed of light, in other words. So it would be a small correction, even if you did do it. So the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, Plugging in for the mass of the electron, 1 half times 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and then times its speed squared, 2.2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second squared. When you do this, you end up with 2.2 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. If you convert that, you get about 13.6 electron volts. So if you sum up, then the total energy of the electron would be the kinetic plus the potential energies which is minus 27.2 electron volts plus 13.6 electron volts, and you get negative 13.6 electron volts. Now, that's the ground state energy of the hydrogen atom. It's bound to the proton, and in order to get it out of that well, you'd have to give that electron 13.6 electron volts of energy. So that's one application of our equation. Now, you can also do the potential energy for multiple charges, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So if you have two charges that are the same sign, the potential energy is positive and the work must be done to bring the charges together. That was what I talked about when we had our two positive charges and you had to force one of them closer if you wanted it there. However, if the two charges have opposite signs, then your potential energy is negative and work's done to keep the charges apart, or in other words, they would fly together if you didn't leave them alone. Now for multiple charges, if there's more than two charges, then you have to find the potential energy for each pair, okay? So for example, if you had three charges, like you have in this little sketch right here, Q1, Q2, and Q3, the total potential energy for the system would be equal to the Coulomb constant times Q1, Q2 over R12 plus Q1, Q3 over R13 plus Q2, Q3 over R23, okay? Now, this is because if you are had those two charges, I showed you the derivation for two charges, Q1 and Q2, but now consider bringing in a third charge in from infinity. What that third charge would see is both of those charges. There would be a force from charge one on charge three as you bring it in from infinity, and that would give you a potential energy associated with that force, and then there would be a force in between charge two and charge three as you bring it in from infinity and then there would be a potential energy associated with that force. So, in other words, it obeys superposition. You're gonna have to add it all up in order to get the total potential energy from these multiple forces. If you wanted to express this in a summation notation, sometimes that's handy. And that's because if you've got a bunch of charges, it gets tedious to write out all those terms. So if you wanna do that, then this is what it would look like. U is equal to 1 half times the sum over J from j is equal to 1 to n. Here n is the total number of charges you've got. And then the summation of, the summation of k not equal to j of k qj qk over rjk. Now, what does that mean? All right, let's talk about double summation notation for just a second. What it means is in the first sum, you're summing over j, okay? But then every time you increment j, you have to do the full sum for k. 
So you take j is equal to 1, for example, and then 4j is equal to 1, you sum over k. And k would be, since you're doing k not equal to j, it would start at 2 and go up from there all the way to n. Okay? So um, then you would go to j is equal to 2, and you would do the sum for k for that value of j, and you would sum k over 1, 3, 4, blah, 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 all the way up to n. Skipping 2 because it can't have a potential energy for itself for point charges. Okay? So we're ignoring that. Now, what this would do is if you did this double, sum, double summation, you would end up counting the potential energy for each particle two times. Okay? So, for example, if you had three charges, you would end up with, you know, J is equal to 1, and then you'd have, um, like, U11, uh, or, I'm sorry, U12, U13, right? Um, and then you'd go to 2, and then you'd do U21. Well, U12 and U21 are the same. So, you don't want to count it twice, okay? So, that's why the half is out front there, all right? It accounts for the fact that you're counting each particle twice in the doubles, in the summation there, all right? So, we'll do some examples on how to do uh, multiple charge in class, and I'll see you there. And I hope this lecture helped review some things for you that you might have forgotten from earlier classes. See you in class. Bye-bye.